Hey noble ones, always good to see you here and today I reckon we need a reality check. So three weeks ago I made a video about inclusivity and history and on that video I spoke about many things but at one point as I was speaking about the fact that sometimes some people call me racist or homophobic for no reason. I've also mentioned the fact that sometimes people call me misogynist too and that usually happens when I mention the fact that historically it was mostly men who went to war not women. And one of the reasons for this, one of the reasons being the fact that men on average tend to be bigger and physically stronger than women, that being a result of what is called in science sexual dimorphism. And then I got these comments. I have appreciated and learned from you for many years, but that ends today. That's quite catastrophic, isn't it? What can I say? Thank you for watching and sorry to see you go. Men are not physically stronger than women, not generally, not on average. Well, that's quite a bold statement you're making there, so unless you support it with factual evidence, aka science, it's just wishful thinking. I was all for your accuracy until your accuracy failed. Well, did it fail? We'll find out on this video, I suppose. Thank you for commenting. Then we have another comment which is quite meaty, so I'll address it in sections. I wouldn't say you are misogynistic for thinking that because of some sort of average men are stronger than women. Well, that's an improvement. I would say that's a very ignorant way to think though. Okay, scratch that. Jokes aside, I'd like to underline that I'm attacking the argument here, not the persons, and again, thank you for taking the time to leave a comment and watch my videos. But I am going to defend what I said. So what did I say exactly? And is it an ignorant way to think? Well, let's check it out. You know, mostly, historically speaking, it was men that went to war, and one of the reasons being the fact that, generally speaking, on average, men tend to be physically stronger than women, which is a scientific fact. So if people get offended by it and call me misogynist because of it, so meaning that I hate women, apparently, then they go together with the people that call me homophobic. Same little group. Well, having listened to my own statement, I'd say it's quite accurate, not ignorant. And again, even though at a human level, I'm always sorry to see people leave the channel, I will not apologize for speaking the scientific truth. In fact, I'll back it up with real, raw evidence that I have gathered from 14 different universities, such as Princeton University, University of London, Cambridge University, Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of Toronto, Department of Integrative Biology, University of Texas at Austin, Institute for Molecular Bioscience, University of Queensland, furthermore, Universities of Knoxville, Florida, Utah, you get the gist. This is what I've gathered all the information I'm going to present to you today. I am saying, let's see what the experts say, genetists, evolutionary biologists. That is in fact an instilled way of thought from a patriarchal society. Okay, I'll entertain that. If that's the case, then the science will not corroborate what I say. It won't hold true. Science will instead point towards the direction of what you and the other commentators said, right? Because I mean, truth is truth. And let me remind you that objective truth is the only truth. Personal truth, political truth, they only are true when they happen to align with objective truth. When they don't, they matter nothing. What I want to be true is irrelevant. It's not about me or you, it's about the real world and what evidence suggests. And noble ones, you'll see why this is important later on the video. Because I found a social justice warriors article about all of this that it's absolutely, well, you'll see. Firstly, averages don't really work too well. They are not even totally accurate. I mean, no disrespect, but I think you're not understanding what the term average means. An average is a number expressing the central or typical value in a set of data. It is not about totality. Please keep in mind, I'm not saying all men are stronger and bigger than all women. I am not dealing in absolutes. Still, in these comments, the main concept that's being brought forth is that it's not true that not average men tend to be bigger and physically stronger than women. I'll address this first. So, are human males on average physically stronger and bigger than women? In most species, selection favors different phenotypes in the two sexes. This type of sexual antagonism can be resolved through the evolution of sexual dimorphism. Males and females differ across a broad spectrum of morphological, psychological, and behavioral characters. In fact, sexually dimorphic traits typically contribute to the largest component of phenotypic variants in most taxa. They use sex to reproduce not just humans 
humans. In sexual populations, the sexes imply different reproductive strategies to maximize fitness, and as a result, shared phenotypes often exhibit divergent sex-specific trait optima. Unfortunately, on the internet, people get misinformed because of this joke of an article that deals with pseudoscientific discourse and asks the non-pertinent question, are men physically stronger than women, or is this yet another way to degrade the female identity? Do you remember towards the beginning of this video when I talked about the difference between objective truth, personal truth and political truth? Politics and activism. It figures. This article has not been reviewed by Odyssey HQ and solely reflects the ideas and opinions of the creator. It figures! Saying that men are on average physically stronger, taller and bigger than women isn't a way to degrade females at all. There are many other things that on average, again, key word that everybody's ignoring here, on average women excel at. This very statement would only become sexist when someone uses it to try and establish the erroneous idea that then their gender is superior or innately superior because of it. The scientific truth is that men and women are optimized for different things. What exactly do people mean when they throw this statement around as though it is an indisputable fact of existence? You gotta be joking, it is an indisputable fact of existence. <laughs> Can you imagine a dull female deer writing an article saying, why do deers keep saying that they have antlers and we don't? As if it were an indisputable fact of existence. Is this a way to degrade the doe identity? And of course you put a picture of a woman bodybuilder. Dear social justice warrior, that picture will be relevant if someone like me said all men are innately stronger than all women. But no one says that. We're dealing in averages. Of course this bodybuilder woman or a professional MMA girl can kick my ass. But that doesn't change the science when we talk about the averages. Are these words truly limited to the female body or do they extend to the degradation of the female identity as a whole? No, they don't. Next one, please. Men are physically stronger than women who have on average less total muscle mass, both in absolute terms and relative total body mass. The greater muscle mass of men is the result of testosterone-induced muscular hypertrophy. Men also have denser, stronger bones, tendons and ligaments. Right then, now, let's see if you can tell me what these two little factoids have in common. Factoids. Thousands of peer-reviewed studies on genetics, evolution, neuroscience by the best universities in the globe. She calls them factoids. It seems that neither of them tell us why it is that these statistics have come to be what they are. They fail to answer questions such as, what is the cause of these differences? Oh my gosh, I really want to see what she thinks is the cause. Let's see why, according to this individual's opinion, that's the case. The first statement, delineated as fact, tells us that biological men tend to have particular characteristics that, for arbitrary reasons, have come to be the qualities that define physical strength. Not arbitrary. There is a specific definition of strength in our language. Strength is the ability of muscles to overcome resistance. Strength can also be defined as the amount of force a muscle or a muscle group can exert. But let's get back to the explanation as to why this difference between men and women is a thing in the first place, because that's it's just gold. Are they in any way conditioned into existence by the environment in which these individuals grow up? From the dawn of civilization, the majority of humans encouraged the aforementioned qualities in biological males. They were pushed to the dangerous tasks, like hunting animals for food, to be aggressive towards intruders. What about all other factors such as those related to outside influence, like males being told from the moment they can speak and even beforehand that they are capable of physical greatness, for example? What about how females Females are told in every way that they are lesser, that no matter what they do, they can never achieve the physical strength of males because males somehow are inherently superior in this sense. Let's dismantle this piece by piece. Buckle up. First of all, sexual dimorphism starts in sex determination's initial switch early in embryogenesis, before we were even born. It is not a construct of society. The various anatomical and physiological attributes of women that are usually mentioned as contributing factors in gender strength differences, including narrower shoulders and higher percentages of slow twitch fibers, which produce lower amounts of force than fast twitch fibers, and all of the other anatomical differences between males and females females which are evident in soft tissue regions and body size, which is also another sexually dimorphic trait, 
These are not there because mummy and daddy told their little boy, eat up so you're gonna grow strong and they didn't tell that to their little girl. We are programmed in embryogenesis to exhibit these differences and I'll get to the real reason why in a moment. This is such a firm fact that there are plenty of studies that discuss the implications of sex bias, genetic architectural differences and their relation to human health, pathogen response and disease control. This isn't bro science. Women, for example, have a much higher resistance and tolerance to pain. And I can see that in my everyday life. Whenever I get a temperature, I don't want to leave my flat for an entire day. When my fiance gets a temperature, she's like, hey, let's go to Taco Bell. By admitting this fact, am I degrading my masculinity? No. Furthermore, when you say since the dawn of civilization, well, you are completely wrong there too, because sexual dimorphism precedes and predates civilization, it even predates mankind. And when it comes to prehistorical men, it's gonna blow your mind to see how wrong she is. So far, this social justice warrior's approach to try and understand why this disparity exists in the first place is to say it's because daddy told Timmy he was gonna get strong and they didn't tell me. Here is how scientists approach this question. The professional approach to understanding why sexual dimorphism evolved in the first place is to measure the actual differences in muscles or in skeletons of males and females of a given species and then look at the behaviors that might be driving those differences. And in general, in mammals, the differences between males and females are usually in those structures that are used as weapons. As I pointed out earlier on this video, elks developed antlers, rams developed horns, and generally speaking, males developed specialized weapons when winning a fight is critical, and humans do too. Males' upper bodies are built for more powerful punches than females. And what this suggests is that fighting between males may have long been a part of our evolutionary history. In other words, we are talking about the implications for sexual dimorphism on fighting ability. Generations of interpersonal male-to-male -male aggression have shaped structures in the human body to specialize for success in fighting. The proportions of the human hands aren't just for manual dexterity. They are also to protect the hands when they are closed into a fist. These biological and behavioral disparities between the roles of each sex can manifest morphologically as structures that aid in sexual display or combat in males or features that aid in reproductive success for females, such as the aforementioned higher tolerance to pain that women have that they need in order to be able to go through childbirth. I mean, if I could as a man, I would love to be able to share the pain with my girl. The problem is that I would probably suck at it. Now, since we're talking about combat, keep in mind that weapons are great equalizers. In other words, give a weapon to a woman and she'll be able to take on a stronger man. And clearly, depending on the weapon, that disparity might be slightly reduced or completely obliterated. I mean, sniper rifle? But it is absolutely ludicrous to think that this disparity in body size and strength between men and women is due to society or upbringing. I mean, look at nature. I don't see anyone going around claiming that the only reason why bucks saw male deers have got antlers is because people are telling bucks, come on guys, bring it on, fight for competition, while these same people are telling those, oh no to you honey, you're gonna become a princess. And that's the reason why those don't have antlers. Seriously, spoiler alert, our genitalia are not the only sexually dimorphic region in our bodies. Furthermore, it doesn't appear to be coincidental in the slightest that these so-called sex differences are less and less the younger someone is. They only become pronounced as the years go on. Have you ever noticed that girls grow up faster than boys? Well, guess what? That's because there is also sexual dimorphism in children. Clearly, sex-specific differentiation of most of these features is absent in sub-adults. But then again, boys don't grow beards and girls don't have breasts. So this only indicates that the initiation of hormonal changes at puberty is largely responsible for the dimorphism. Now, since this person also ignorantly mentioned the testosterone situation, I'd like to explain that one too. Sex hormones responsible for pubertal transition are found in both males and females. However, estrogen naturally occurs in higher levels in females and testosterone in males. Estrogen and testosterone facilitate different rates and trajectories of skeletal growth in both males and females. They dictate the maintenance of skeletal muscle mass and influence body size differences between the sexes. These contrasting hormone functions result in heavier bones and larger ultimate adult skeletal size for males and lighter and smaller bones for females. 
The question remains, what exactly creates high levels of testosterone? Testosterone can be found in every human body. We just said that. Doubtedly, this could contribute to increased numbers, but could it really account for the overbearing differences that exist in testosterone levels between the binary sexes? Has it not, in fact, been shown that high levels of aggressiveness, libido, and even confidence are directly related to said levels? Oh my god. So basically she's saying it's because men act in a certain aggressive way because they've been told to do so. And by the way, my parents never told me to be aggressive, but I'm just saying just because men are, are told to be more aggressive, that's the reason why as adults, they gain more testosterone. Well, we were just talking about children, right? Well, a little later during the juvenile period, something called adrenarche occurs when the zona reticularis of the adrenal cortex matures and begins secreting higher amounts of adrenal androgens. All the behavioral tendencies I just mentioned hold one thing in common. They increase levels of testosterone. It is curious how the very thing that is assumed to be the cause of increased physical strength in biological males is linked to exactly the sort of behavior that is encouraged in and often forced upon them. The same sort of behavior that increases the very particular hormonal level. Estrogens, mainly 17 beta estradiol, are one group of sex steroids that play a critical role in embryonic, fetal and postnatal development and the effects of these hormones are mediated through nuclear estrogen receptors such as ERS, ER alpha and ER beta thinking that the only reason why there is a difference in body size between males and females is come on Tom go play football with your mates is ignorant on a multitude of levels and yet I was called ignorant because this is yet another example of a societal tool being used to degrade the female identity. Specifically, we see science being used under its objectivity veil in order to justify the status quo, the belief that women are weak and less than men. First, you are the one saying this. I never said in, uh, I don't know, how long is this video? I never said women are lesser than men. Secondly, science uses objectivity because science has to be objective and the fact that you ignore that means you shouldn't even use the term science in your pseudo excuse of an article. Thirdly, at least half of the studies I have used were written by women scientists. But let's go back to the second comment because we've still got stuff to talk about and this time has to do with history. So you know, something I know a little about. But your average guy out there doing the same daily chores that the women did as much of the work required all hands, not a certain gender or even age for many, I have no idea what you're, what you're on about, would be about as strong as the woman. No, we have just demonstrated that's not the case. And that's not really taking body size into account. Exactly, you're not taking body size into account. You should. Another factor that also often not taken into account is the fact that many women have historically and recently never changed, tried to fight in one way or another. I have no idea what you're on about. Because if you're talking about war and battle, no, many women historically haven't tried to fight. Some women did. Uh, in some cultures, of course, you will have a higher percentage of women that know how to use Use weapons than in others look at the Roman Empire go back in a time machine and tell an ancient Roman women should be legionaries he would laugh at you because of their culture it didn't happen even in Japan where we do know that they have on Abu Geisha it's still a minority it's a few situations here and there and they were exceptional at least as far as the accounts tell us but you don't have an entire battalion of women samurai that didn't happen plenty dressed as men to do male jobs it wouldn't be surprising if some actually managed to pass as a man in a battle if they truly wanted to it's I don't know what you're talking about. And most, now check this out, and most of the army was in fact peasants who weren't skilled, which is another factor not taking in. Uh, excuse me, what army? Because again, well, the Roman army was professional soldiers. They weren't farmers. Yes, of course, in the very early period of Rome, yeah, they were farmers, but that doesn't mean, you know, a person who is a peasant, first of all, is quite strong because people who work the land, you know, secondly, who says that they can't be skilled? Um, but even in the medieval period, knights, men at arms, they're professional. Mercenaries, condottieri, professionals. Crossbowmen, like the Genoese crossbowmen, professional mercenaries. What about the archers, long bowmen? Men in medieval England were training how to be archers. But then if they did other jobs in the meantime, if they were peasants, or if they, even if it was a tavern keeper, it doesn't matter because they were trained. You know how many years it takes to train a successful war archer? 
We're talking about eight years, seven years, 10 years of training to be able to use war bows. You don't think that these people were skilled? Such as the armies during the Battle of Agincourt, thousands and thousands of archers. You're telling me they're not skilled? This is the best part. Lastly, can we talk about how convenient it is that whenever we have a confirmed grave of a man with weapons and all that jazz, he's obviously a warrior, but a woman's nah, she just must be high status. The weapons and shields, those must be her husband's because she missed him or something. The horse skeleton buried with her, well, everyone knows girls love ponies. Like for real, it's pretty obvious there is some sort of patriarchal bias still going on today when grave sites are literally treated like that. If a man buried with a sword and a shield means he was a warrior, there is absolutely no reason to assume the same on a similar grave but a woman. And especially on the ground that some men are stronger than women. Oh my gosh. Okay, so what you are expecting professional archaeologists and historians to do is they find a grave, they need to completely ignore the cultural provenance, they need to completely ignore when or, or the, the, the customs of that culture and if they see a woman with a sword and a shield they have to say because you're basically saying there is absolutely no reason not to think so you want a 50 50 you want to say oh there is a woman's burial grave and she's got a shield and a sword and then I have to say it, she must be a warrior because otherwise I'm not being fair again you know the previous person we just read understood nothing about science and unfortunately this viewer of mine and again I'm not attacking you but you clearly don't understand archaeology and history because archaeology is based on first the culture of provenance if it's a roman grave it doesn't matter if it's a woman with a sword it's clearly not a warrior if it's a scythian grave then maybe there is a higher chance that she was going to be a warrior because of the cultural situation the reason why archaeologists tend to do that is because in most cases it's exactly like that and the reason why they know that the woman is buried with a shield and a sword and a spear that belonged to her husband is because we have data that tells us that that was the practice. Again, it doesn't mean that all burial grounds containing skeletal remains of women with weapons are automatically going to be it's their husband. That's not what archaeologists do. They have to examine this at a three-dimensional level from all possible perspectives and then they determine and, and give us their best guess of what the heck was going on with that grave. And guys, sorry, but half of y'all are not stronger than the average woman. Half of y'all are short and twigs. Interesting how you just said at the very beginning of your comment how averages are wrong and not totally true and now you're giving an average that has absolutely no basis. Half of all men are short and twigs. But yeah, for real, the grapes are really the breaking point for most women in that regard. No, not for most women, just for SJWs, because I know a, sh a lot of women who are smart, intelligent, cultured, educated, and understand perfectly what's going on when there is an archaeological an archaeological site. There is an obvious double standard at play and it's being pushed by only one gender. Okay, there is a disparity. The disparity between the bodies of men and women. Is it fair? No. Is it fair that reproduction for me is just having a good time and then reproduction for a girl is having a good time plus nine months of pregnancy plus all the pain of childbirth? Is that fair? No. Is it fair that I don't have a period every month and my girl does? No. So there is a disparity. If you, the other commentator or the person writing that joke of an article really dislike this disparity, don't complain to males. If you are religious, complain to God. If you are not religious, complain to an evolution by natural selection. If you believe in both, pick your poison. And that ends the video today. I hope that you enjoyed it, noble ones. Thank you very much for watching as always. And if you're not yet members of this community, become a noble one. Subscribe to my channel for more content from the Mentatron in order to get always cold facts, no bullshit attached. Thank you very much for watching. And remember, the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye.